Monday morning. Welcome to Connect, the California MBA's weekly podcast featuring one-on-one interviews with movers and shakers in the mortgage industry. I'm Dustin Hobbs, Communications Director at the California MBA. We've got a great guest today. I'm really excited to talk to him. He's one of our oldest and best friends here at the California MBA, a longtime supporter of the association. So I'm excited to hear his uh, perspective on the industry right now. He uh, works on the commercial side of the business. So a little bit of a yeah, departure from uh, our usual focus more on the residential side. So It'll be interesting to see uh, his take on where we're at now and where we're going in the future. Uh, but before we start, let's thank our sponsors over at Incelerate. So Incelerate, the leading mortgage lead management, CRM, and engagement platform that helps lenders close more loans by increasing efficiency gains across sales, marketing, operations, and management, has recently announced the uh, first-of-its-kind mobile app that they've uh, just launched here in the last couple of weeks. This groundbreaking mobile app features full lead management, lead distribution, click-to-call, inbound call routing, first call automation, and two-way compliant text messaging and provides access to critical loan information without having to use a laptop or log into their LOS system. It also empowers loan officers by intelligently distributing leads, managing pipelines, prioritizing their day, automating best practices, and personalizing the borrower's journey, all from their mobile app. So for more information or to catch a demo, visit Incelerate.com or call the number listed here in the description below. All right, before we get into the conversation here, I want to toss it over to Susan Malazzo, our CEO, for this week's weekly video update. Susan? Hi, this is Susan with your weekly update. Well, August 31st marked the end of regular legislative session in California, so I wanted to give you a quick update on a couple of measures that were significant pieces of um, legislation that we worked on in the final weeks of session this year. AB 1436 was amended at the beginning of August, to include many of the same problematic provisions that we saw earlier this year in AB 2501. Among those uh, were the automatic one year of mortgage forbearance, as well as the loss of the ability to foreclose on a property for any violation of any of the intricate details of, uh, of the bill. Through weeks of negotiation uh, with legislative leadership in the administration, Uh, A new bill, a new compromise bill was agreed upon and we passed AB 3088. That measure includes a safe harbor, a CARES Act safe harbor for both federally and non-federally backed loans. Uh, It removed all reference to multifamily lending and it also removed any mandates for forbearance. Um, The measure um, does extend the California Homeowner Bill of Rights protection to rental units. It also takes effect immediately, is passed on an urgency measure, which means that it takes effect immediately to um, help those who are um, in need during the um, the COVID crisis. Also, earlier this year, we reported that the Department of Business Oversight was to be uh, reorganized and renamed the Department of of Financial Protection and Innovation. This would expand its licensing authority and um, uh, um, enforcement capabilities throughout the financial services um, industry. Again, through weeks of negotiation, we were able to um, get an exemption for those entities that are already licensed and regulated through the Department of Business Oversight. So if you are a CFL licensee or a CRMLA licensee, you would be exempt from the new provisions. What the new department is going to do is focus on uh, licensing and regulating those entities that are not currently licensed, but are providing financial products to consumers in our state. So we are very pleased with the outcome on um, both of these measures. And um, I would like everybody to know that California MBA relied very heavily on the national MBA uh, for legislative uh, data and resources throughout um, the entire legislative cycle this year. Uh, we are very proud of our, the outcome of these legislative measures, these victories, and we want to thank the National MBA for being there with us every step of the way. You guys were awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to mention we have one more MQAC webinar for the year. Um, typically, our MQAC webinars are held on the fourth Thursday of every month. In September, that conflicts with our Western Secondary Market Conference, which is, of course, a virtual event. So we are moving our uh, last September um, Uh, MQAC webinar to October 8th, and that will be on the topic of CFPB's new interpretation of UDEP, and we have Lauren Frank and Sherry Safchak from the Buckley Law Firm as our presenters. Again, that's on October 8th. We'll have information out to you shortly as to how you can register for that free event. That's it for this week. Back to you, Dustin.
All right, thanks, Susan. Appreciate that update. And all right, let's get into the conversation now. I'm excited to welcome David Rosenthal, President and CEO of Curtis Rosenthal. Uh, David, welcome. David is a, uh, um, a long time, like I said, a long time supporter of the California MBA. He's actually the only company, Curtis Rosenthal, the only company to continuously sponsor the Western States Craft Conference for, I believe now we're in our 23rd year. So David, thank you for the long time support of the association and the Western States Craft. You're our, like I said, are one of our oldest and best friends in the industry. Our pleasure. Always happy to support the CMBA. Yeah, and uh, I should mention, David, if you want to give us uh, maybe you know 30 seconds here, tell us about the company, what you guys do, and then we'll uh, jump into our uh, Q&A. Absolutely. So we're, uh, we're based in Los Angeles. We're a commercial real estate appraisal firm. I'm an MAI appraiser, and we have MAI and other designated appraisers on staff. Uh, we appraise commercial properties of all types, uh, predominantly throughout Southern California, but also throughout the rest of the state, and uh, we can go to Arizona and Nevada. Um, as you'll hear in a minute, I've got a background in lending myself, so uh, we try to understand the lending issues related to um, uh, the property valuation process, and we, we try to help provide solutions. Uh, if there are challenging issues, we're, we're there to figure them out and to help work with our clients to, to try to understand and, and figure out how to work through challenging times, especially like we're seeing today. All right. All right. Thanks, Dave. So uh, let's, as you mentioned, let's uh, dive into your background here. Tell us, uh, you know, how you got started in the business and what led you to uh, found the company. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so I've, I've got to be honest, it was a bit of a circuitous route. Uh, I studied undergrad uh, finance and accounting at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Go Gators. Um, went on to grad school at Northwestern in Chicago, got my MBA at the Kellogg School in Finance, and um, made my way to Los Angeles to be a corporate banker with Security Pacific Bank, where I was specializing in um, middle market merger and acquisition finance. Uh, after a few years of doing that, I left with uh, a couple of colleagues to help Jerry Buss, uh, the former owner of uh, the Lakers, and his partner, Frank Mariani, uh, to help them to uh, purchase a savings and loan back in the early 1980s. Um, we negotiated or worked with them and, and tried to negotiate the purchase of the savings and loan, uh, came in number two uh, in a uh, in, in the race, ended up not getting that, and um, uh, during a time of very high interest rates, uh, for, for those that are newer to the industry, believe it or not, uh, the prime rate at that time was about 17-18%. Uh, the industry was a little rough, and uh, we started uh, piling up some debt. So um, uh, ultimately, we realized we, we needed to take on something to, to pay off the debt, uh, one of my partners, Bill Curtis, um, with whom I, I founded Curtis Rosenthal, uh, had been an appraiser uh, prior to being a lender at the bank. And he suggested, why don't we do this uh, to pay off the debts and then we'll move forward from there. So in 1983, we, we started Curtis Rosenthal as an appraisal company. Um, interestingly, I found out that my background in corporate valuations was uh, directly applicable to real estate valuations. And uh, so we picked it up and started running. And um, before we knew it, we hit the refi boom of 1986. And uh, we, we were off and running with a, a business that uh, just seemed very natural to us and seemed to be a very good fit. Yeah, yeah, it seems like your, your backgrounds were a total match made in heaven there starting the company like that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's uh, fast forward then to uh, today. What's your your take on the industry right now as uh, as we sit here on the 4th of uh, September here? What's your take on where we're at now and, and uh, from your perspective on the uh, appraisal side? You know, this is such a time of great uncertainty, Dustin. It's um, everyone that we talk to in the marketplace is is trying to make their bets, trying to, to figure out what to do with um, the, not enough information. This is something that, that hasn't happened for 100 years. Um, nobody really knows where we are, where we're going, what it's all going to look like. We, we have an economy that's been decimated on the, on the jobs front, but at the same time, it's been propped up by uh, huge uh, government funding. And uh, that shows in the stock market, things are still very bullish there. And I, I think it also shows on the tenant side where uh, you have a lot of tenants that are really 
holding up okay because they got PPP loans and that's helped to sustain them. But those PPP loan funds are starting to run out and it remains to be seen how are these tenants going to do in the long term um, once they have to really just make it on their own. Um, owners of uh, properties, retail properties, they probably have a fair number of tenants that are either paying reduced rent or not paying rent today. And the question is, how long will that continue? Which of those tenants will survive? Um, you know, what, what do those properties look like in, in the future? Uh, also office properties, you, you have to wonder, uh, we're, we're evaluating ourselves, how much office space do we really need going forward? Is it the amount that we have? Do we need less? Um, it, what does it look like in the future? And nobody really knows what, what will we all go back to once COVID is uh, in the rear view mirror. Uh, on the multifamily side of things, it's also very curious. You, uh, you have millennials who had all been out on their own with high paying jobs quite a number of them have lost their jobs and uh, quite a few have moved home. And so that discretionary income isn't what it once was. And you're starting to see uh, reductions in rent, higher vacancies. Uh, there, there are a lot of moving parts here and uh, we, we just don't know where it will go and how long it will last and ultimately what it's gonna look like after, uh, after this is all behind us. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. What uh, do you think that uh, the the problems on the on the retail and office side specifically? Do you think that that's more of a um, sort of a national policy issue, or is that going to be more driven by state by state lockdown policy? And when those are reduced at at uh, various states, I know like you know obviously Florida has got different uh, you know lockdown policies than we do here in California. You know, I think it's going to be both a combination of of uh, policy and also consumer tastes. Uh, let's talk about the retail side. I, in in addition to uh, running my appraisal company, I'm also uh, part of a joint venture where we develop grocery anchored shopping centers in the southeastern U.S. And uh, it's it's challenging and interesting. Um, we uh, we have grocers that are doing better than they've ever done. They're just knocking it out of the park. Um, but on the other hand, the inline shop tenants, uh, some of them are paying reduced rent, some of them are paying no rent, some of them are going out of business. And uh, like retail, you know, one of the things I like about retail is that historically it continues to reinvent itself over time. I mean, if you think back uh, when department stores first came into being, uh, that, that was a radical shift in the notion of, of uh, stores. It took people off of street front retail and put them all into one big space. Well, retail is going through that same kind of change. And uh, as many people probably heard, COVID is just accelerating that change. Uh, E-commerce is changing the way we, we shop and the way that we think about doing what we do. COVID has just accelerated that. More people are shopping online. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I, I talk to friends and a lot of people like that online experience for certain things. They don't like it for other things. I know I, I live in Pacific Palisades. We've, we've had a, um, a local hardware store forever. Uh, the hardware store um, uh, didn't renew their lease. They were gone for two years. So we learned how to buy uh, hardware equipment online. It's not a great experience. Uh, I, I like to do a lot of projects at home. There's nothing like walking around your local hardware store, talking to someone in the shop and talking through a project and picking up this widget or that widget. Uh, we, Absolutely. I hear you on that. As someone who does a lot of home improvement projects myself and doesn't really know how to do most of them, I do appreciate being able to talk to another person who's usually done that project first. Exactly. So I, I, I think that retail will continue to be a very viable sector. In fact, as you'll hear in our retail uh, future retail session, uh, there are some bullish aspects about retail, but you have to have a long-term perspective. In the short term, it's going to be very bumpy. Uh, there will be those that don't survive, just as there were during the, the um, global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, some, some tenants will go away, but there will be new tenants that will come in and take their place. Restaurants will figure out how to morph. Um, I, I talked to my older son, who's 30, and he's getting out a little bit. And he said, you know, Dad, it feels a lot more like Europe right now, because when you go out to a restaurant, you're sitting out on the street. That's kind of how they do it over there, and people over here are figuring out how to do it. So I, I think, I think it will be a positive, um, positive aspect in the long term, but it's going to be pretty choppy water for a while until everybody figures it out. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it, just from the restaurant perspective, I mean, especially living in California, there's no reason why we can't do restaurants outdoors most of the year. I mean, I can't imagine how that's going to happen in, you know, say New York, but certainly for California, you know, that seems like a, a honestly a nice thing. I kind of like eating outdoors when we, whenever my wife and I do go out to dinner. It's nice to go out you know, outside rather than being kind of stuck inside where it's either way too cold or just too loud. Right. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's move on here now. Uh, we're going to be, if you're not already registered for the Western States CREP Conference, if you're watching this before it starts, make sure to register for that, obviously, right now. And uh, you can hear uh, David and company talk about the future of the retail sector during his panel. But also one of the things we're going to talk about, we're getting a uh, sort of an exclusive behind-the-scenes tour of the new SoFi Stadium that uh, is... Uh, uh, just recently completed, actually, in uh, in Hollywood Park area in LA uh, for the Raider, or I'm sorry, the Rams and the Chargers. And uh, David was actually uh, a part of that tour. And so, David, tell us a little. What's your thoughts on the impact that stadium is going to have on that that area in, in uh, LA? Oh my gosh, this is going to be such a game changer. It's you know, for a lot of years, when people thought that the stadium was coming, there were people who were speculating because the property is in the city of Inglewood. Inglewood has historically um, not been a, a, a major uh, venue center other than the Forum. And uh, during the glory days of the Lakers, the, the Showtime days, uh, it was great fun, but people would come in, they'd go to, go to the basketball game and they would get out as, as quickly as they could. Um, and the rest of, of Inglewood, it's kind of a, a bedroom community. It's, uh, it's got a downtown that was um, sort of tired and, and uh, needed some attention. Well, this Hollywood Park development, uh, they, they took over what had been uh, the old Hollywood Park racetrack. And to put it in perspective, as you'll hear uh, on the tour of the stadium, it's three over 300 acres of land. It's almost a city within a city. Uh, also, yeah, put it's like, you know, it looks like it's almost twice as big as uh, the space that Disneyland takes up. Actually, I think it was almost four times. Is it? Yeah. Almost four times the size of Disneyland. So if if you think, I mean, Disneyland, when they developed it, it was all orange groves. You look at what's happened down there now, and it's the epicenter. And I, I truly think that the same thing will happen over time in Inglewood. Uh, they've, they've created um, terrific access uh, to and from the stadium. And it's not just a stadium. It's, it's a whole district. Um, uh, creative office, media, retail. They're going to have a massive um, retail area that, that will feel good. They're, uh, well, you'll hear more about it on the tour, but it's it's going to be amazing. And then residential, That uh, my guess is it looks a lot like the residential in Playa Vista, uh, which is very upscale, um, very high end. And when you have that much money coming into one area, it's it's certainly going to spill over into the surrounding areas. Yeah, yeah. Well, and even you could talk about the the NFL's commitment to the area. They they're moving the NFL network building and headquarters right there to that same site. And so it's it is impressive, and, and you know definitely it's something to something to stick around for. That'll be the reception on the first night of the CREP conference on September 9th. So make sure you stick around for that after the final session that day. Yeah, All right, let's. Uh, or go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was just saying it's it's a terrific tour and really really worth the time. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, switch gears here a little bit. I'm curious, how has the company and uh, you know, sort of the commercial, you know, valuations industry overall, how have you guys all adapted to the new sort of uh, COVID-19 reality? It's been a real challenge, but I, I've got to say I am so pleased at how quickly we've been able to morph into this new reality. Uh, the the first question was, how do we operate without an office? And we figured that out pretty quickly, you know, just like so many people have. Everybody's working from home. Uh, we we connect with each other in our office. We're plugged in through Microsoft Teams, so uh, we can connect, video chat, chat, uh, share documents. That all works seamlessly. We've got our phone system going through there as well. So we got all the technological pieces worked out pretty quickly. Um, uh, then the next question was, how do we inspect properties? I mean, that's a real issue in the COVID world. How do we inspect properties? And that that wasn't just a, a, a company issue. That was a, a national appraisal policy issue. And I've, I've been involved with people at, at the national level on um, determining how, how do we appraise properties and how do we inspect properties in a manner that is safe and sound. 
so initially, uh, we, like uh, a number of other firms, put down the mandate that nobody goes out to the properties. Everybody stays home. We've got to stay safe. That lasted a few weeks. Um, and I've got to say, according to uh, USPAP standards, the appraisal, uh, the national appraisal standards, that's okay as long as you disclose what you did and how you uh, learned about the property. Um, and people have gotten creative. They're in some cases where it just doesn't make sense to go out to take a look at the property in person. Uh, we, uh, we've had clients take a cell phone and do a video chat where they take us on a video tour and we record it and they walk us around and we tell them, look to the left, look to the right. You know, what do you see? Help me figure this out. Um, we can also rely on older appraisals, older inspection reports, um, uh, published information that CoStar might have or LoopNet might have. So that's one way to do it. But um, candidly, the, the feedback that I got from, from the majority of my uh, professional staff was they really want to go out and kick the tires. And I, you've got to respect that. So um, it, we're, we're, for the most part, going out to take a look at properties. Uh, if it's a commercial property, it, you know, of course, we wear the face mask. We use the hand sanitizer. We socially distance. Um, uh, we try to look at vacant parts of buildings, if they have people in there, of course, we, we stay away from them. Um, in apartments, that uh, uh, we certainly don't, don't want to go uh, intruding on people that are living in an apartment. So we'll look at vacant units and just try to get a representative sampling of uh, unit types uh, based on the vacant units. Or uh, if, if we're looking at an occupied unit, we make sure we take a look at it when the tenants aren't there and the property manager will walk us through. So surprisingly, that part has, has all worked itself out. Uh, on the valuation side, that's that's been interesting. In the early part of COVID, we've been having to uh, extrapolate from the market what the market is thinking about the impact of COVID on valuation. And the feedback that, that we've gotten is the following. First off, um, we have to take a look at not only the rent roll, but the rent collections reports. It's not something we used to look at in the past. We used to trust that if tenants were in place and they, we showed that they were on the rent roll, you know, we figured they were paying rent. Today, we've got to see the collection reports since uh, going back to March, and we see who's paying rent, who's not paying rent. Then it gets very granular. We have to go through on a tenant by tenant basis and, and try to determine which tenants are gonna survive, which tenants are not gonna survive, what does that do to uh, cash flow of the property? What does the reabsorption of those spaces look like? Um, when do we anticipate that these tenants, the tenants that are paying either some rent or full rent, when do we think that they'll really be able to get back to full business again? So it's it's become much more granular on figuring out the cash flow, uh, the, the collectability of income, um, getting to a stabilized income. And of course, we have to make projections of when do we think things will get back to, to a stabilized normal? Um, and then figuring out vacancy issues and finally tweaking cap rates. Uh, you know, we survey the market. We ask people in the marketplace, what, what are they doing? And we've actually been surprised um, how little the cap rates have trended so far. It's not to say they're not going to change more, but what we've seen so far, it's been, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points, but it hasn't been the... 100 or 150 basis point shocks that um, that we might have seen back in 2008. Yeah, so I'm curious. Uh, you know, I have to imagine the the uh, your background in uh, you know uh, company valuations. That seems like that you know certainly has come into play now. Do you think yeah. that uh, with the you know going through the collections reports and not necessarily just the you know looking at vacancies and all that is that uh, do you think that's something that's a, a permanent change in the uh, valuation side on the commercial in the commercial industry or is that just sort of you know until we get through covid well it's certainly until we get through covid and uh, beyond that it remains to be seen um we don't know what the new normal or the next normal is going to look like uh if, if we get to a next normal where tenants are in place and paying rent and honoring their leases throughout the remainder of their term then you know we we can probably drop back on on some of that granular tenant analysis, and and again we we've been through this uh, 12 years ago with uh, with the global financial crisis. We kind of had to do the same thing back then. There there were different reasons for what was going on. It was more of a capital markets issue and not not so much a 
uh, a global overall global health issue and, and all of that and policy issue but we still had to at that time take a look at the viability of tenants it, how long would they be able to sustain themselves what would they look like in in the long term and that that stayed on for a few years i don't know two three four years but then eventually once things kind of settled down and the market started back on an uptick again I, we, we didn't have to get as granular anymore because everything was go go you know very bullish and once you signed a tenant you felt comfortable that that they were there and they were going to pay the rent sure so more of just a temporary you know, mode that you pivot to during times of crisis and then once things settle down you can pivot back that makes sense right um so let's uh, uh let's pivot in uh, on a topic again here i'm curious to know your thoughts on this uh, so we've got a couple on the commercial side a couple of big ballot measures coming out this year in uh, November that are going to be in the on the California ballot. And if you're not in California or not uh, in the know on this, there in short, there's one that uh, is going to focus on rent control and one that's going to focus on uh, what's called split roll uh, colloquially here in California. Uh, essentially, uh, Prop 13 it, it would essentially divide Prop 13's protections uh, on the residential and the commercial side. And while keeping most of the uh, protections on the residential side, it would certainly gut those Prop 13 protections on the commercial side. So I'm curious from your thought, uh, let's say both of them or one of them pass in November. What impact is that going to have, you think, on the uh, commercial market and also just the overall economy in California? Uh, so we'll speak to the rent control uh, for a minute first. I, that one doesn't concern me as much because we have so many cities that already have rent control and we know how they operate. We, we have fairly good background. Uh, we have statewide rent control right now, and um, it, it, people have figured out how, how to manage with that. I, I don't see that. I mean, certainly there are operating issues related to it, but I, I don't see it as, as um, being a, a huge uh, valuation issue or, or what have you. I think people will adapt pretty quickly. Uh, the other one, though, the split tax roll, I've got to be honest, I think it's a disaster in the making. Uh, the intention, as I understand it, is, hey, let's grab some funding from the wealthy property owners because, boy, they've all got to be rich. Well, guess what? They're not all rich. And right now they're hurting. Those property owners are hurting. And uh, a, a side uh, unintended consequence that comes from this is that not all commercial properties have the property owner paying the property taxes on triple net leases those expenses are all passed through to the tenant so who does this end up hurting it ends up hurting the small business owner the 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 nail salon the uh, the the hair salon the gym the you know all these these um entrepreneurial businesses that are the the uh, lifeblood of california all of a sudden they're going to be um taxed with with a much heavier burden their expenses go up and that's at a time when they're struggling to get income in the door. You know, you can't get blood from a stone. And ultimately, I think it hurts the tenants. And then it will hurt the landlords because it, it the, the effective occupancy cost goes up for the tenants. That will have to squeeze itself out by um, effective rents dropping over time. So watch that ripple through the system as well. That it, it, You've hurt the tenants first, then you've hurt the landlords. And ultimately, who who gets up holding holding the bag? It's the lenders. You have lenders. Uh, the the owners still have to make their debt service, but they have to make their debt service with reduced rents uh, because effective rents have dropped. I I just think it's an absolute disaster in the making. I think it'll be awful for the economy. And frankly, I I think it could cause uh, businesses and property owners to leave California and um, to go to other states to uh, try to avoid the kind of problem that they have. It's I, I think it's a, a, a nightmare and I hope it's not passed. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think that, unfortunately, I think that the proponents of the, uh, um, the ballot measure underestimate, you know, that uh, one of the reasons why so many businesses do business in California is because of the current tax structure. And if they lose the, that protection, to your point, I think that, you know, a lot of them, especially nowadays when, you know, every business can be so much more mobile and remote than in the past, maybe they don't need, maybe they realize they don't need a brick and mortar in California, or maybe they realize they just need fewer, you know, a smaller footprint in California. And, you know, then to your point, that ripples down to the landlords and the property owners and the lenders. So right. definitely. 
So we'll put uh, uh, information in if you're interested in uh, getting involved or, or donating to the uh, the no cause uh, for the prop. You could there, find information in the description below here on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, so you know, similar vein here, David. You've always been a big supporter, I know, of uh, industry groups like the California MBA, the National MBA, the uh, uh, Los Angeles Mortgage Association, LAMA. Um, why? What, what's your? Why have you always been so involved in those associations and, and industry groups? What do you get out of it? In my heart of hearts, I just have this absolute passion for bringing people together and creating opportunities for people to have real human connections. It's, I, I've done it since I was young. It's just what I'm all about. And um, in this industry, I, I think the commercial mortgage industry is one of the greatest industries for people making human connection because that's that's where the magic happens. That's that's how deals get done. People do it based on the trust that they have with other people in the industry. So um, anything that I can do to try to bring people together, to get them to open up, to get them to connect with one another, I'm all about it. Um, with uh, CMBA has been fantastic. The, uh, the annual Western States Conference, uh, what, what a great opportunity for people to get together, connect with one another, share in a fun, enjoyable educational setting. We've tried to replicate that on a, on a smaller level, just as Bama has done in the Bay Area. We've, we've done that for the last 20 years with Lama uh, in Los Angeles. And it really, it creates a community. And um, in, in this uh, uh, disparate world that we have today, where people have their heads in, in their computers, like we do right now, uh, not by choice, um, it's uh, we. I still really, really believe in the uh, the notion of real, heartfelt, personal connection with one another because I I think that's where you build the trust and that's how that's how deals and business get done. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's interesting when we've been planning as we pivoted from just from an association standpoint as we pivoted to doing all of our our uh, uh, big conferences on a virtual basis this year. I think without a doubt that the, one of the biggest concerns we had was on the commercial side, how do we replicate that in-person, you know, deal-making, handshaking atmosphere that's always happened at the Western States Craft, as you mentioned. I think even more than on the residential side, just having that personal connection and, uh, you know, seeing people in person, seeing people that maybe you only see a couple of times a year, I think it makes a huge difference in sort of it's the grease that keeps the the engine of the industry going right now. And, and uh, you know, hopefully next year we'll actually be able to see each other in person, shake hands, and uh, you know, catch up. And a uh, you know, as my as my 11 uh, year old daughter would say, IRL in real life next year in Las Vegas. So um, hopefully we can uh, get past some of this uh, you know online only and virtual only atmosphere and get back to some real in person handshakes. Um, so let's uh, our last question here, David. Let's uh, leave us with, on a positive note. What can commercial uh, real estate finance uh, pros do right now to not just survive and and uh, you know hang on by their fingernails in the next uh, you know few months, a year, or however long it takes to sort of get to as you mentioned a, a new normal? Um, but how can they thrive in the current atmosphere? So I would suggest three three specific things. Um, number one, stop watching the news. Just Stop watching the news. It's so depressing. I, I, I don't care which side of the politics you're on or which side of the belief of what's going on with COVID and everything. It, just stop watching the news. Go about your daily life. You'll learn what you have to just through osmosis, but don't get so absorbed and addicted to seeing what happened today. What did this one say? What did that one say? I, I think that's toxic and, and completely non-productive. Second thing, uh, following on the heels of that, is just make it a point to stay positive and upbeat. Just get up every morning, whatever you have to do, whether it's exercise, meditation, yoga, um, some quiet time in nature, just do whatever you have to do to keep yourself positive, upbeat, so that you can be a source of inspiration for others around you. It rubs off. People like to do business with people that they like to be around, and people like to be around people that are positive and upbeat and forward-looking. So just make that a mindset, and it, particularly in, in this COVID world, it, it takes work. It really takes effort, but really cultivate that positive mindset. And then the third thing is use this as an opportunity to get creative. Think outside the box. Um, uh, look for uh, creative ways to reinvent yourself 
reinvent the way that you do the things that you do, connect with people in un unusual ways. Um, I, I'll, I'll share with you working from home just this week. I, I uh, played tennis with a, a client who's, who's a good friend, but also a client. It's fantastic, you know, in the non-COVID world, probably wouldn't have done that, but we had had a great time, great conversation, great connection, of course, socially distant. Um, I've gone for bike rides with, uh, with clients, uh, gone for walks. Um, you know, there are different ways to get out and connect with people other than, you know, the traditional, hey, I'll meet you at a restaurant, let's sit down and have lunch. Um, we can get out and do more creative things and uh, just to reach out and figure out better ways that we can connect with other people and provide solutions because at the end of the day, we're all in the service business. That's our job is to provide solutions. So really take this COVID opportunity to take a look at who we are, what we do, how we do it, and try to reinvent ourselves in a way that, that works both in today's world and also going forward. I think that's great advice. Great advice, David. Thank you. So before we uh, take off, though, I should uh, also give you an opportunity here. Uh, again, we've got our Western States CREF conference coming up later this week. David is uh, moderating our panel on the future of retail. David, you want to give us a quick preview of uh, what uh, you and the panel are going to talk about? Absolutely. We, we have two um, great, great sources of, of information. We have Art Perlman, who is uh, the former chairman of Riley Perlman uh, Retail Shopping Center Development Company. Uh, Art has developed 42 shopping centers in his career, ranging from grocery anchored up to uh, massive big box. He brought Walmart uh, into California, first one to bring Walmart into California. He's seen it all. Um, he's also won the ICSC uh, International Council of Shopping Centers Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, he's one of, one of a handful of people to do that. And he also teaches real estate development at the Wharton School in Philadelphia and also at USC. It's just a, a absolute wealth of information on uh, the development side of things and tenanting and that sort of thing. We also have Matthew May, who uh, is a retail broker. Um, he does uh, uh, both tenant rep and landlord rep. He um, does some very creative work. He, uh, he does um, property brokerage, sale brokerage, as well as retail leasing brokerage. And um, he's just a student of the retail business. He does more research than anybody I know. And uh, between the two of them, it, you'll see we have some very interesting and lively interchange and some real creative ideas about the future of retail. So I, I really encourage everyone to join us. Right on. I totally agree. So yeah, if you haven't registered yet for the conference, wscref.com to uh, register for this year's Western States CREF conference. And hopefully we'll uh, see you there virtually later this week. And that does it for uh, this episode of Connect. Thanks again, David, for joining us. Uh, I think it was a, a great conversation. And uh, whether you're on the commercial or the residential side of the industry, I think there's a lot of nuggets in there to take away. And if you enjoyed this conversation, make sure and subscribe to us here on our YouTube channel. You can also uh, listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, and uh, you can find us there as well. And then also uh, make sure and uh, check out the description below for the links and the number for Accelerate and uh, you know, find out more about this podcast and those coming up soon. And with that, we'll leave you and we'll see you again next Monday on Connect. Mm -hmm.